Let me start recording. Great. You can all see the recording. It's okay. You can start. Great. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for this uh, new uh, no, um, lecture that uh, we would like to start uh, every year. So that would be a Nobel presentation lecture for the current winners uh, of the Nobel Prize. So this year winners are Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson from Stanford. And they, they won the 2020 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for the title is Improvements to Auction Theory and Inventions of New Auction Formats. Um, so what we are going to do today in this lecture is to go through uh, the contributions of uh, um, Milgram and Wilson. And we will do it with a broad perspective, not only about auctions, but to understand uh, their contribution in auctions, you need to understand a bit more about the environment in which they, they did their PhD and in, in which they, they were um, teaching and doing research, which is Stanford. Uh, so Jean-Pierre Ponsard will start to give you a personal perspective on Robert Wilson as a PhD supervisor. So Jean-Pierre was a PhD student of Robert Wilson uh, in Stanford. Then Beatrice Charrier will move to, to introduce you to the, the, the Stanford as an institution, the economics department and the historical perspective in the evolution of the economics department. And I will focus on the market design of auctions, so specifically the main results and the big contributions in auction theory by Milgram and Wilson. And even though the Nobel Prize is about auctions, we wanted to give you a broad perspective of all the contributions of the two authors that have so many contributions and they have important contributions in game theory too. And so we thought it would be important for you to, to know these contributions. So that will be done by Olivier Gosner. And uh, Beatrice will uh, finish the, the lecture with a, a perspective on the history of thoughts and or auctions and market design like fits in the general history of thoughts uh, in economics. Uh, so Jean-Pierre will start. So please Jean-Pierre, you can share your slides. So you are muted, Jean-Pierre. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, you know, to be here today with uh, everyone here to uh, celebrate uh, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, indeed, you know, as Julia mentioned, I, I, I was a PhD student of uh, Bob Wilson quite some time ago, actually. Uh, I thought that uh, you know there is a small video uh, that uh, will get us uh, directly into the subject. Uh, I will. Uh, my, my presentation is on Bob Wilson. It's focused on Bob Wilson as a PhD uh, supervisor, not only for me but for uh, all the, the million of, of students that he had. So uh, let uh, let's start with a small uh, video that will just talk about Bob as the teacher and uh, actually uh, about auction. Okay, so I'm sharing. Paul? It's, it's Bob Wilson. Yeah. You won the Nobel. You won the Nobel Prize. I was asleep and the doorbell rang at two in the morning and I saw Bob's face and he was knocking at the door and telling me that uh, they were trying to call me and that we had won uh, the Nobel Prize in economics. He had turned off all of it, both his landline and his cell phone. So I just came over. They asked me, the Nobel people asked, that, would I please go over and knock on his door? <laughs> <laughs> so Bob was my dissertation advisor, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I got interested in auction theory because I wanted him to be my advisor. I'd been advised by Ben Holmes from one of your previous oh, students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, well, the first thing you need to do is get Bob to be your advisor. So I picked on a topic that interested him. I'd like to mention he's the third of my students to receive a Nobel Prize. I'm very proud of that because I'm, I'm a teacher and I take great pride in the successes of my students. People think about art galleries or eBay for that matter. They think about buying you know, one thing or selling one thing and uh, people competing to buy or sell that one thing. These are really simple auctions, but there are complicated auctions in the world too. The theory of auctions is really just a special application of game theory to a special kind of game. The key thing is there were actually many items at the same time. 
the auction goes on until there are no new bids. So it's an auction that's designed to be transparent, to be slow and methodical. We worked together to design the first uh, U.S. Uh, radio spectrum auction, which is a novel design that became the basis for many other designs and billions of dollars of transactions around the world. And setting that up in a way that uses bidding is something that nobody knew how to do before. And we were able to innovate new economic methods, market design methods that made that possible. Well, he's a phenomenon, so he's very precise, very rigorous. He thinks like a mathematician in a very rigorous, uh, detailed kind of way. I'm more of a speculative thinker. He's very <laughs> precise. For me, Bob and I think very differently. He is a much more visual thinker. He would draw graphs and pictures of things which I would go home and try to decipher and try to figure out um, what he was talking about. But it was, it was inspiring, but uh, it was also stretching me in new directions. It's so great to, you know, we're enthusiastic about what we do, you know. Yeah. We're we like it, and, and, uh, and it's exciting. Yeah, and so I continue to be excited by new things, and, and uh, that's a great life to be able to live this way. That's the end. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll go back to my uh, sharing my, my screen. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, Let's see, uh, here is the gang up for, you know, uh, uh, you recognize, you know, from left uh, to right, uh, Bob mentioned that he has uh, three uh, students that uh, have the Nobel Prize now. On the, on, on the left, you have uh, Arad. Uh, Arad got the Nobel Prize in 20, uh, 2012. Actually, uh, he, he got the, the, the prize for uh, his work on uh, matching, and he got the prize uh, uh, with uh, uh, Lloyd Chaplin. Then uh, uh, we have uh, uh, on the right, we have Bengt Ostrom, 2016. 20, uh, Bengt Ostrom got the prize, uh, the Nobel Prize for his work on the contract theory, and uh, he had the prize with Oliver Arthur and Ian Riddle. You already know their faces, you know, Paul uh, Middle and uh, Robert Wilson in the middle. This is a picture that was taken at the ceremony of Bent Armstrong some years ago. Uh, so uh, actually, Bob had quite uh, many students. Let's, let's, let's go back a little bit uh, before we, leave, we see uh, some of the, the students. You know, he, he actually wrote his dissertation in uh, 1963, and his dissertation was with uh, Howard Reffa. Howard Rafa is a, a well-known leading figure in game theory, but actually Bob's uh, dissertation was on mathematical programming, a simplicial algorithm for concave programming. He, he published, uh, you know, seven papers in prominent journals in this area, in management science, forest and research. He had two PhD students uh, in the mathematical programming, Ed Show, who had a uh, in a kind of eclectic career. He's a representative for Wiccan uh, at some point. And Peter Chenegrin, who now is at the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Bob's interest in uh, game theory uh, uh, started quite early. Actually, he participated in a conference that, uh, and in uh, Aix-en-Provence. It's, it's a very well-known landmark uh, conference. Uh, made on CNRS, uh, it's called the decision, the decision. And there were quite many very uh, uh, top people at that conference. Orman, uh, you know, who got another prize, Bersh, Borsch, De Bruyne, another Nobel Prize. Dres, who has the, the, the director of the core uh, center uh, in Belgium. Guilbeault, Avocor, Roy, Chaplet, another uh, uh, Nobel Prize, etc. And now we have a, a fourth Nobel Prize with Bruce. You know, for, for you, you know, it's not an accident. You know that uh, uh, Bob got into uh, game theory. 
uh, you know, there are close links between uh, mathematical programming and game theory uh, for the Martin Zero Sum game and also uh, for the search for looking for algorithm to get fixed points and things like that. Okay, and very early uh, after that, you know, Bob had uh, students in, in game theory. The, the, the first one is uh, Bob Rosenthal, who unfortunately died in the early 20s. Uh, I happen to be the second, you know, I, I, I not realize that. Uh, for some reason. And Claude Dapremont, uh, Claude Dapremont uh, was the third one. And, and Claude Dapremont, you know, was uh, just as Paul Wigram. He had inside information. He, 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 he was inclined to go, he, was, he wanted to go to Stanford. And, and John Gatsevich, who was also at core uh, at a conference uh, in Aix en said, hey, you have to make sure that you should pick Bob as your supervisor there. Uh, then uh, Bob uh, Wilson had many more students. Here is a list of some, you know, I, it's not maybe, just maybe not complete, but here I'm, uh, the one I could identify. Uh, you, <laughs> many of them are, are very uh, top researchers. Uh, I have listed a number of uh, universities where they are. Uh, <laughs> And also the nationality where they come from, and you, you, you see that uh, they, they, you don't see it on because you have, well, it's, it's on the right uh, anyway. They're coming from very different uh, 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 countries like uh, Finland, India, India, Hungary, Russia, Italy, Turkey, Japan, Ukraine, China. Uh, that's that's really impressive, you know, uh, that he, had, he, he built that reputation. Uh, to attract uh, very, very uh, good students uh, along all the years coming from everywhere. Now, what, uh, what, uh, what are the, 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 the key factors that make uh, him so attractive as a supervisor? I, I, will, uh, I will give some insight coming from my own experience. Right? Uh, I, I, I arrived at Stanford in 1969 and I took a, a, a game theory course uh, it was a very large spectrum course in the cooperative and uncooperative game theory. And I'm quoting uh, Bob, uh, in, in, he says in, in, in another of his talk, he says, uh, you know, I, I'm doing theory in the morning and application in the afternoon. And uh, I very I, I remember that during this course, he discussed his first paper on auction theory, which was published in 19. 67, I think, and it is about bidding with asymmetric information. It's all bidding, and uh, you know, it happens that uh, among the bidders, one of the bidders owns already a slot which is adjacent to, to the slot that is going uh, open for bids. And the, you know, it, it, the, the thing that he has uh, that he has this slot uh, makes it a viable, it, it, it provides opportunity for this, this company. To, to drill you know, in oblique fashion and, and then try to have information on what, uh, uh, what is it that there is on, on the slot that is open for bid. So he has, he has very private information on the bid. And, and Bob's paper says you know, that under these circumstances, uh, the value of, of the bid for the other bidders is zero. Uh, well, they have to bid because otherwise, you know, the informed bidder uh, would get it for nothing. But uh, they cannot make money out of that. And in that intuition came to some of the leaders. So uh, he, he got that first paper, I think, uh, in, in this area. He also was giving a, a PhD seminar. And the, 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 that PhD seminar has been going on you know, for years. You know, uh, and uh, he, he, he focused on recent research. And uh, uh, during this seminar, he, he talked about uh, some recent research that was being done uh, by Oman and Nasher. And that was part of, uh, of a, a work done on a research grant for rent on disarmament, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, about uh, the, 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 the zero sum games with imperfect information and uh, with, uh, again, you know, with uh, one informed player. So you have two players, you have states of the world. Uh, that are not known to the players, but it happens that one of the of the two players uh, will has the has information while the other doesn't have information. 
and Oman and Mashra prove that if this game is infinitely repeated, then the value of this uh, infinitely repeated game uh, is just the concavification of the value of, an, of the game in which nobody is informed. This, uh, this is known as uh, the calf property. Uh, this is, it's, you know, it took years, you know, to uh, uh, Oman, Nashler, and then Mertens, and, and, and Zamir, and then Sohan, you know, they, 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 they work on this for years, and they published a very uh, wonderful book on this. Uh, uh, I, so, so that triggered my, my curiosity, uh, you know, the value of information is something I, I was uh, interested in. So I did my dissertation on this subject. Uh, then uh, uh, Bob really provides, you know, very, very continuous support to his students. Uh, and, and that, I really needed that because, you know, uh, as, as, as a foreigner, you know, he really helped me and write properly and do things. And we would spend like an hour, you know, every week. Uh, and also he provided me the opportunity, you know, to participate into the summer school uh, in economics at the economics department. That was very, very, uh, you know, stimulating. And that provided me the opportunity to meet Oman, you know, and, and I was completely scared, you know, because, because uh, you know, Oman, you know, I did so uh, exciting, so, so, so deep work on this, uh, uh, infinity repeated games, and I was working on a much simpler game, you know, uh, a sequential game, a uh, one stage sequential game. And I was almost sure, you know, that Oman would, 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 would just say, well, you know, that, that's, that's very simple. You know, it's of course, you know, of course, you, 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 what you idea is that you again find the, the calf property, uh, but uh, of course, that's easy. Well, no, he, he was surprised. He was surprised. So uh, my, my topic was safe, you know, I, I could continue. Uh, then uh, Baba actually uh, gave continuous advice, you know, I think to his uh, to his uh, students for uh, recommending you know early choice in in, in Korea, and he, he really helped me to to go to uh, Yaza. You know, I, I made a postdoc at Yaza, where I met uh, George Dancy, you know, which everybody knows in admiral programming, and uh, Ray Faro is the head of the Yaza uh, at that time. I also met uh, Michel Balinski, who was to become the head of the laboratory of economy at Polytechnic. And that, that stay as a postdoc there was really very instrumental in getting me back into research and doing work in particular, and then when I came back with, with, with Sohan. Uh, now, uh, you understand you know, that uh, if you <laughs> have Bob as a, as a supervisor, uh, this is a, a, a it, it provides an opportunity for a lifelong friendship. And uh, uh, I must say, you know, that uh, uh, with Claude, with Claude Papamon, you know, we, we organized a conference and, and in particular one in, uh, that was memorable in the south of France in Cassis, and, and you invited him, we invited, I think, Oman as well. Uh, and and uh, he, he, he would occasionally come to, 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 to Europe and make a stay in, 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 in Paris to give a uh, a lecture at Polytechnic already about 10 years ago, I think. And uh, we, we, we certainly, we certainly hope, you know, to have uh, Paul and Bob in person at Polytechnic uh, you know, when, uh, if, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, else permit, you know, travel and things like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that was a very wonderful experience. Now, uh, there is one key factor also, which I should mention, you know, that is the attractiveness, you know, of, of California. You know, you have the desert with the rocks, you have the mountains, you have the ocean, you have the sequoia, and, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, why, why did I come back to the Plateau de Palaiso? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, so Beatrice will uh, you take the next presentation. So Jean-Pierre, can you hear me? Can you see the slides? All right. Uh, so Jean-Pierre did a wonderful transition because what I'm gonna talk about first is basically California. <laughs> Um, in, in the context. And so um, I'm going to talk now about one specific question that is why Stanford in later at the end of the, project, the presentation 
And I'm going to talk about how this prize uh, belongs to a long tradition about thinking about markets uh, and what markets do in economics. So first, this question, why Stanford? So Jean-Pierre just uh, talk about um, these genealogies uh, um, um, started by Wilson and all his students and, and end up saying, okay, all this happened in California. And what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna uh, try to demonstrate quickly is that this is not an accident that this happened uh, at Stanford. Uh, if I go back to um, how Wilson himself framed uh, um, the beginning of his uh, uh, lifelong research agenda on, on auction and market design. You can see here a, a few quotes. It would say from a case study on an auction of leases conferring rights to explore for oil in offshore uh, tracks. I saw that the bidders relied on imperfect estimate of uh, what, what they should bid for. Uh, and then it continues and say, throughout the um, 70s, I worked as a consultant developing models of bidding for offshore leases and also afterwards for other businesses. And on the client side, you have like testimony like Sam Horan, uh, who worked at Xerox, uh, Palo Alto, uh, who said, okay, it was the 70s, it was the, be it was the beginning of uh, um, some sort of new technology and very broadband communication, and we had a problem that was, uh, this doesn't exist, so we don't have customer, so how do we set prices? Okay, no one knows that. So how do we do? We just phoned Stanford, and we talked to Wilson, and Wilson introduced us to the whole area of nonlinear pricing market design. And in this quote, you see a whole context that sort of enables uh, the rise of market design. Uh, this quote, oh, sorry, uh, was not done. This quotes highlight three things that are uh, specific to Stanford, uh, the importance of engineering school to answer design issues. And design is not something that was born out of Wilson program. It's been in Stanford for a century. Uh, and these issues are raised by industry who talk to researchers, in particular infrastructure industry in California, the development of California was predicated uh, on the development of infrastructure industry, first railroad, uh, and then um, energy infrastructure industries, and then uh, the, computer, um, the computer business. So this is what I'm gonna show, uh, these three elements were super important in the development of, of, of market design. Um, the first element is this kind of engineering culture. It's not specific to Stanford, MIT also has an engineering culture, but it created a different type of economics. Uh, the engineering uh, culture at Stanford, it was, Stanford was created by railroad barons and from the outset, they sort of established a big engineering department and in that engineering department from the beginning, they had economics course. Why? Because at Stanford from the, from the beginning, from the earliest 20th century, it was uh, understood that if you want to be a good engineer, engineer, you had to calculate wisely and part of what you could design uh, was determined by economic calculation and how best you could use one dollar and what you could do out of it. Okay, so here is the quote, the design of every part excepting few and the whole is finally judged from the economic standpoint. Okay, so from the beginning at Stanford, you had that culture that if you want, if you want to do some engineering, you had to do some economics. At the beginning, it was more something close to accounting and then to microeconomics type of calculation. And then it, it, after the war, it became uh, it became so from accounting, then you had a development of a whole new set of tools that was uh, that was uh, fostered by uh, the war context. Uh, so I don't have time to go in, in there in details, but uh, during the World War II in the United States, you had the development of linear programming, statistical decision theory, operation research, optimal control theory, inventory theory, pretty fast. Uh, uh, to to like produce better weapons uh, quicker to be better organized uh, organized in the war effort and these techniques they were here at disposal after World War II and they were taken by Stanford engineers and Stanford economists and they try to uh, develop new way to understand the economy and in that post-war generation as well, you had this close uh, tool exchange between economists and engineers. I'm gonna give you three examples. 
uh, from more general to uh, more specific. You have, you have here a quote by Mark Nerlovi, who, uh, who uh, was uh, one of the architects of modern production function in economics. And he wrote to uh, a military general and say, okay, uh, there is, um, there are, in economics, there are two things. The science of the economy, by which it means more macroeconomics, uh, which might not be very useful to you directly, but there is also the science of economizing, okay? So rational choice theory and how we implement this through, for instance, operation research. And here, this is of paramount importance to you, to you people in the military, to you engineers and whatsoever. Another, oh, sorry, another, uh, so there were ties between economics and engineering. And the third, uh, leg uh, in the stool was management. Okay, it was also very early understood that economics in engineering and operation research, in particular, uh, could improve management. You see here the introduction of a textbook written by Alan Mann, who say who says there is a fruitful collaboration that has opened up an area sometimes known as engineering economics and operation research that can really help improve business practice uh, in firms. And uh, you on so and you even had like some uh, people trained in engineering. Uh, that was a, 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 the case of Holly Shinery, who sort of were trained as engineers and as oil engineer, for instance, and who slowly transitioned into economics and who say basically I see parallels between the way I should think of a production function as an engineer, the physical principles, the, the inputs, the outputs, and the, the necessity of having a design law, and the way to do it as an economist, when you also have a different production function with input and input and a kind of research and search for design law. So that's the tradition in which uh, um, Wilson would uh, arrive um, in, in the late 60s, and this tradition was intellectual, I mean, tool exchange between the economist, engineer, and managers, and it was also institutional. You had the department has created, the engineering department has an operation research uh, group with a lot of economists, an economic system group with a lot of economics, and, and the Stanford Business School also had engineers and economics pretty early uh, on and sort of like fluid relationships between these uh, three disciplines. And you also had a uh, tool exchange between the university and its context and its economic context and its uh, economic milieu. And uh, after the war, you had the development of the Stanford Industrial Park, like incentive uh, for business and infrastructure business and computer business to just set up uh, quarters in the area. So the Stanford uh, Research uh, Business Park is basically what became the Silicon Valley. This is in that context that uh, Wilson arrived, okay? Uh, so uh, that's, that's the, the specific Stanford context. One, one thing I just wanna add on top of that is that at the same time, there was a sort of revolution in game theory, uh, which Wilson we actually take and bring to Stanford. Uh, there was, because it was a Cold War and because you had to think about conflict and conflict resolution, uh, people like, uh, like Schelling, for instance, suggested that uh, game theory could be a good tool to think about conflict resolution between the USSR and the US and whatsoever. And this challenge was taken up by people like Harsony and Zelton, who sort of moved from uh, game theory to, uh, ga games with uh, incomplete information uh, towards game with complete but imperfect or asymmetric information and you gathered from Jean-Pierre presentation what use could be done about imperfect uh, uh, information games uh, then, okay? And that, that was one tradition and you also had the rise of uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian analysis and someone who stood uh, at the, at the uh, meaning of all these two tradition was Bob Wilson. He was trained at Harvard as, as Jean-Pierre stayed and he just uh, took all this tradition and came to uh, the graduate business school uh, in Stanford and so benefited from the uh, engineering design and business environment I just described to actually develop a research program 
that was uh, that that uh, Julien and Olivier are going to talk about. Okay, so this research program uh, based using the tool of game theory to rethink, for instance, pricing and then to rethink auction was predicated on uh, an engineering epistemology and it allowed him uh, to um, close the, the story to actually train some engineer students. Ross was an engineering student. Uh, Oldstrom uh, had been in engineering working in Halstom before he actually moved to Economist. Uh, so he enabled him to uh, train uh, engineering undergraduate into his new economics program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Beatrice. Thanks a lot. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, so I hope that uh, Polytechnic students uh, see also the, how we can be inspired by, uh, by Stanford and how close we can be in terms of spirit and the way we can see economics also here at Polytechnic. Yeah, that's something I didn't say. I mean, Jean-Pierre mentioned a lot of French students at Stanford and French students coming from Polytechnic. That was another engineering tradition. So that makes the, the bridge. Great, thanks. So uh, it's my turn now, I guess. So let me share my screen. Yeah, so you can all see the slides. Great. All right, so um, on my side, I will talk to you about the, all the main results and all the, the, the results in auctions evolved uh, over time. And, um, and my talk will be pretty standard for people who know a bit auctions or follow a course. So I hope that uh, it's going to be interesting for people who don't know about it and maybe a refresher uh, for people who, a reminder for people who forgot about this stuff. Um, um, but the, the view I want to take, I'm a market designer, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on matching. So my uh, personal uh, uh, star is Al Roth, uh, but uh, I'm happy to... Uh, to talk about Paul Milgram here and, and, uh, and Wilson. But the, there is really a view of market design and, uh, and I, I will try to convey it into this, uh, this lecture. So first, there is a simple observation is that auctions are everywhere. Okay? They are used, so maybe you as an individual consumer, you don't realize it, but they are used to sell a lot of things in practice. So selling commodities like flowers, fish, diamonds, financial securities like government bonds or shares on fin financial markets. They are used to sell rights for, you know, spectrum auctions like uh, Wilson and uh, the video showed in uh, Wilson and, uh, and Milgram. Uh, rights to extract minerals or oil also in certain places. Uh, they are used to provide good or services like public procur procurement contracts where, you know, uh, uh, when public institutions want to build a new building or, or, you know, provide a new service, they will, like private companies will bid for contracts to have the right to, to, to gain that contract. Uh, electricity is one of the big applications. E uh, EDF, EDF in France is using uh, auctions to set the price of electricity when you have demand and uh, supply. And obviously, um, in the more recent times, due to the rise of internet platforms, you have places like eBay, of course, to sell goods uh, by individuals. But you also have, you know, search engines such as Google. They use auctions to price the ads uh, on their search engines. Okay, so that's important implications of auctions today. And so what is nice about auctions is that it's very the perfect example of the spirit of what we call market design. And to me, market design is really this back and forth between theory and practical applications and empirical things. And it, there is no like clear causality, you know, the theory is here to help to design better practices but also practical questions and the, 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 the current practice are used to refine the theories and you are, you are really creating this self-reinforcing loop uh, that is traditional to, to market design and auction is a perfect example of this. And so, you know, I will, I will go through these different results over time and you will see how the theory evolved gradually toward this more applied and design practice. And so, you know, I would say that it started from a very standard uh, micro theory approach. You have a clean tractable model that allows you to give very detailed uh, results in a sense that this is the best mechanism you should use. I can prove it to you with a theorem that this is the best uh, mechanism or procedure you have to use to maximize revenues or efficiency. And uh, you know, Claude, Claude Daspremont is uh, with us today. So, uh, so the design of uh, efficient mechanism is uh, really one of the main uh, innovation in this literature and he has contributed mainly to it. And, um, 
but you know there are there are models so they are not perfect to 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 capture all the subtleties in life and so once you gradually go to more complicated and more practical problems then the theory is useful can be a guide but is imperfect okay and so you need to real, rely a bit like in engineering you know to rely on a bit of ad hoc methods trial and errors uh, um, you know calculations that guide you but they are not capturing all the different elements i will give you some examples of that in auction design and at the end nowadays auction is design is truly interdisciplinary okay it uses like um, economic theory uh, it uses behavioral and lab experiments to test how people react to complicated auction designs Obviously, it uses statistics and econometrics uh, to to study the, the the you know expose the auctions that have happened. Uh, and nowadays, you have a lot of computer si science and operations research going on because you know complex spectrum auctions are very complicated and very combinatorial. And even deciding who wins the auction can be complicated, as you will see. And so, computer science and OR has also contributed mainly uh, to this uh, evolution of auction. So I will give you a really a, a crash course, a very small course of, of, of auction. And so the, the very first model that was introduced by Vicre in 61 and 62 was the, the single unit independent private value model. So what is the single unit independent private value model? You have only one good to sell, okay? very, very standard. And Vicre studied uh, the, the, the strategies and the outcomes of four standard types of auctions. So the first standard uh, type is everybody submits his bid in a sealed envelope, okay? and you open the envelope, the highest bid wins and pay his bid. This is what is called the first price auction. The second price auction is the same procedure. You open the envelope, the highest bidder wins, but he pays the second highest bidder uh, bid. And then you have the sequential counterpart. So the famous one that is called the English ascending auctions, where you start from a low price, you increase it gradually, and the auction stops when there is only one person left who is willing to buy at that price. Okay? So you, everybody is in initially, you increase the price, people just drop out of the auction, and then you stop when you have, the, when you have only one person left and he pays the price that is uh, uh, the one um, on the clock. Then you have the, the reverse uh, version, that is called the Dutch descending auction. You start from the very high price. Nobody is in initially. You decrease gradually the price, and then the first person raising his hand is winning the object at that price. And so what? Uh, so then to study how people uh, behave in these auctions, you need, you need to have a theory of what are their utilities, what are their preferences over the good, and the simplest possible possible way to think about uh, uh, utilities first is to assume that utilities are independent and private values. So what does it mean? It means that for a bidder i, his valuation for the good is just one number vi that is you know, proper to him. It does not depend on the valuation of others. And all these valuations vi are independently distributed across bidder. There is no correlation uh, in the valuation of the good. So there is a good, I have my own taste for the good. I'm the only one to know this taste. It does not depend on the taste of others and we are all independently distributed. Okay. And the three main contributions of Vicre was to show first that the English auction is strategically equivalent to the second price auction. They would have the same outcome. The Dutch auction is strategically equivalent to the first price auction. Importantly, in the first price auction, he showed that you should not bid truthfully. Okay, so that's an important uh, result. And it solves what we later on call the Bayesian Nash equilibrium, but it solved it five years before Bayesian Nash equilibrium was invented because it was invented by Arsani five years later. So he solved it in this particular uh, environment, which is the first price auction in the IPV model. And um, one very important result is that once you solve the equilibria and you calculate the expected revenues, you realize that the first and the second price auction expected revenues for the sellers are the same. And so that was a very uh, surprising result at that time. Okay. And um, the intuition, so Vicre won the Nobel Prize for this together with Arsani in 96. And the rough intuition that I can give you about this revenue equivalence is that, you know, in the first price auction, obviously you should not be truthfully. Why? Because you will end up paying too much. If you know that your opponent has a low value, you should just bid enough to bid this opponent, and you will pay that 
you know, if he has a value of 10, you, you bid 10 plus one euro, and then you win the good, and you pay the minimum price to win. In the second price auction, you can be uh, truthful because you are not going to pay your bid. You are going to pay the bid of your highest opponents. So you will pay exactly what you need to win this auction. And basically, this intuition makes that in the first price auction at equilibrium, what you will do is to bid exactly the value of what is enough to win. But obviously, you don't know this value. So you will bid the expected value of what is enough to win. And you see the connection here in the both case, you have like the enough to win. And in expectations, these things will end up being equal in terms of winning. So it's a very rough intuition that I'm giving you here. And this result that we call the revenue equivalence was generalized by Meyerson in 81, and he won the Nobel Prize in 2007 for this. And, um, and he showed that actually many auctions, different auctions have the same uh, uh, expected revenue at equilibrium. And one important point in uh, Meyerson and also all this analysis of auctions is that if you are looking to maximize revenue, the auction that you will use, it's not going to be the same as the one you will use if you want to maximize efficiency in a sense that efficiency in a sense that you give the good to the person who values it the most. And so that's an important result in this literature. And so you see that the independent private value model is clean. It's interesting to study, but it's not perfect and it's not capture all the possible application. And so Jean-Pierre mentioned and, and, and Beatrice mentioned this, uh, this problem of, uh, um, of uh, bidding rights to extract oil in, uh, in the US. And so Wilson, because of you know, uh, industrial uh, questions of these companies started to model this auction to sell rights to extract oil in the land in two papers in 67 and 69. And so it's still a single unit auction, but now you relax the independent and private value assumption. So me as a bidder, what matters for me is the total quantity of oil, this V here that is in the land. And everybody cares about that number. This is the important number because once we know this quantity, we can extract the, the winner will extract this oil and gain you know, market value out of it. And so the problem is that Nobody knows this exact number of the, um, of, the, um, of the quantity of oil in the ground, but we all observe a signal. So, you know, a bidder I will observe an estimate of the quantity. And, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a clean uh, uh, world, you will have a, an unbiased estimator of the true quantity of oil. So you will observe V plus a, an epsilon shock that will be an expectation zero. And so in expectation, you have the right uh, uh, estimated quantity, but you know you have some noise, and so what? What Wilson and and you know what was also known in practice in these auctions was that you have a phenomenon that is very well known now in the auctions that is called the winner's curse. So what is the winner's curse? Is that in this setting where people all value the good in the same way, if you win the auction, it's probably bad news for you. And why is it bad bad news? Because Assume so if everybody is symmetric, when they bid, they will use a strategy which will be I observe my signal of the quantity of oil. When I know this estimated quantity, I decide about my bid. If everybody is symmetric, they will use the same bidding function. And that this function will be increasing in your signal. So the, the, the highest, if your estimate gives you a higher quantity of oil in the, in the land, then you will bid higher. And so if you, so initially, your signal is an unbiased, unbiased estimator of the true quantity of oil. But if you know that you win the auction, no, it's not the case that your signal is an unbiased estimator. Because if you win, it means that you had the highest possible signal. You won the auction, your bid was the highest. But knowing that now you had the highest possible signal, it means that you were too op optimistic about the value of the, of the quantity of oil because the expectation of this maximal signal is greater than the max of the expectations, which are unbiased. So that are the true quantity of oil, which means that your initial estimate of the quantity of oil that was based only on your value was, was overestimating the true quantity of oil once you know that at the end you are winning the auction. So because of this effect, this is a selection bias effect, because you know that in this common value context, when you win the auction, it's bad news. You need to be careful when you bid. And so basically, you will try to decrease your bid to try to avoid this problem of regretting ex post to, or to pay too much for the, for the, 
the, the good that you are buying. And so that was an important um, phenomenon and still an important phenomenon in auction. And um, so, but the common value model, you know, it's, it's practical and uh, for this problem of oil extraction, but it's not the most common model we can have. There are other practical practicalities where you might think that our values are correlated, but they are not exactly the same. We do not, co we do not care only about the, the, the quantity, but we care about different things, but we have correlation and interdependence in our valuation. So this is a, um, uh, this is a general model where each bidder is observing his own signal about the element of the auction. And my final valuation for the good as a bidder will depend on the signal on, of everyone else. But I don't know the signals of, of the other people. Okay, So our valuations will be, will be uh, interdependent. And the signals we observe, like in the oil uh, extraction model that I showed you before, will be correlated across bidders. And this is not a so simple problem to solve mathematically and to solve the, the, the equilibrium of the resulting auction. And at some point, we lacked quantitative tools, mathematical tools to study this problem, okay? That was uh, uh, difficult to, to, to solve. And so in an important paper in 82, Milgram and Weber, they introduced an important condition on the joint distribution of signals that we call affiliation that allows you to have a clean uh, mathematical properties for the conditional expectations that are useful to solve uh, the equilibrium of the auction. And basically affiliation reflects the intuition that if I know that some signals are, are high, it makes it more likely that the other signals are also high. And so you need to, you need to, to formalize this, this intuition. And that's what they did uh, in the uh, with introducing, when introducing affiliation. And they, they use affiliation is di directly inspired by, by works in lattice theory in mathematics and uh, in the works of comparative statics by top keys in uh, mathematics. So they really imported these tools from mathematics to, to solve practical problems in auctions. And so this has been a very important uh, contribution, a technical contribution, but very useful to solve uh, practical auctions when you have interdependence between the valuation of uh, the bidders. And one of the very important results that they showed in their paper is that now the revenue equivalence that I talked about uh, in the IPV model does not hold anymore. Meaning that if you use an ascending English auction, it will generate higher expected revenue than the second price auction. So remember, second price auction, we all submit our bids in an envelope. I don't observe what the other people are doing, and we are just opening the envelopes. The ascending auction, I observe when people drop. I see the price increasing. I see people around me dropping at, at certain price, and so it gives me some information. And that's the, that's the intuition of why it's important to use sequential auctions in this context where valuations are interdependent. Because if you use a simultaneous auction, like the second price auction, you face the risk of the winner's curse that I told you before. Okay, you don't know the, the the signals of the others, so you need to you you need to be very careful when bidding. So bidding tends to be low at equilibrium. So I'm being very informal here, but it's to give you some intuitions on this. But in an ascending auction format, you will observe people dropping along the auction, and it will give you some information on their own valuation. Because when you see someone dropping at a certain price, you say, OK, so I know that your valuation will be at least this, or at most this. And so I can infer some information and update, refine my own estimates for the good. And if I refine my estimate, it allows me to bid more and to bid more aggressively. Okay? And so that's the intuition of why these ascending auctions generate more revenues. And here, the theory will be used as a guide, and the guide will be when values are interdependent, ascending auctions and sequential auctions will allow bidders to learn more about the true value of the good in the process. And so let me move on to the final step of the design of auctions in the, in the history of this literature. That is when you relax the fact that you have only one good to sell. So in practice, it's a very important problem because uh, as uh, we saw in the video uh, that Jean-Pierre showed us, um, in spectrum auctions, you have to, to sell several spectrums at the same time, and companies are interested to buy several spectrum uh, licenses at the same time. So in 1994, in the US, the Federal Communication uh, Commission 
sold spectrum rights for the first time using an auction. So before that, it was a very relatively obscure process with a committee hearing and even random assignments at some point in history, which was highly inefficient. And when they decided to sell um, this using an auction, they raised 20 billion in revenue in the first auction, which was twice the forecasted amount. And the design of this auction was proposed, um, was, uh, the proposal was made by three economists, so Preston McAfee and Milgram and Winston. And so this, uh, I will show you what was the proposal, uh, the, the technical proposal to, to, uh, for this auction. And so what you have to keep in mind is that when you have multiple object, multi-object auctions, they are not easy to study theoretically. So you don't have a so clean theoretical analysis. So we know that there is one perfect candidate in theory that would be what we call the Vicray clark groves uh, auction. The problem with this auction is that it's usually impossible to use in practice due to combinatorial problems. And so in practice, they will use other types of design, but these other types of design will typically have multiple equ equilibria. You will still run into problems of combinatorial problems. And so now the theory is more viewed as a guide to, to guide us on how to design these practical auctions. And as you will see on some aspect, it's going to be hard to capture all the relevant practical details. And there is a little bit in the, of trials and errors and you know, ad hoc solutions uh, um, uh, that have been done in practice. So I will try to show you some of this in the design of this FCC auction. Uh, so what was the proposal? It was called the Simultaneous Ascending Auction, SAA. So when you have N bidders and L licenses to sell, then the bidders basically will bid simultaneously on many licenses at the same time. So me as a bidder, I can bid on, on, uh, on one, I license one, but also on license two and three at the same time. And so the auction works in rounds. So at the given round, bidders submit bids to on as many licenses as they want. And at the end of the, of the round, you announce all the bids by everyone and you, you claim who you, announce who will be the potential winner for each license, which, which will be the person who has the standing high bid and the value of the standing high bid on the, on the license. Then in the next round, once you disclose this information, bidders have the opportunity to submit new bids in the auction. But to submit a new bid, you need to beat the standing high bid on a given license. And usually we will ask you to beat it to beat it by a certain increment. So let's say you need to be 10% more than the previous I bid on this license. Okay. And so this is an important design because it allows you as a bidder to, when you see the price increase between different, uh, um, the relative price changing between different licenses to change your bid. So if I see that license one becomes too expensive for me, I can change and start to bid on license two. And this simultaneous, uh, simultaneity in the rounds allows you to do this updating over time. And so the auction finishes after a round when there is no new bid on any, any licenses. And then you, you know who has the standing high bids on each license. And so they, they won the corresponding licenses and they pay their bid on this license. And so this design was you know, guided by theory and was also some part of the design was also uh, um, done due to practical uh, concerns and problems. So first, why did they choose to do this simultaneous uh, auction, uh, sequential auction? Exactly for the reason I just explained to you in the interdependent value case. In the theory, we know that one result is that sequential auctions, they help, help the bidders to learn their values over time for the licenses. So you use this theoretical result to, to to, to claim that this sequential uh, design will help the, the, the bidders to learn about the valuations. One practical problem is that you as a bidder, you have an incentive to do nothing. Maybe you want to wait the people, the, for the people to bid to learn the valuation of others. And at the very last minute, you can submit a high bid, you know, a bit like in eBay, maybe sometimes you can observe these people at the very last minute, they come and they make a high bid and they win the, the auction. And it happens also a lot, a lot on charity auctions for arts, for instance. And one of the design solution, practical solution that was proposed by Paul Milgram is, is, is kind of famous now. It's called what is, what is called the activity rule. So you have many different versions of it. So I will, I will show you, uh, I will explain to you one of these versions. 
So you will force bidders to be active during the auctions. And the way you do it is that you, you give to each license K a quantity, exogenous quantity XK. And usually this quantity will represent you know, the population covered by the li given li spectrum license or the bandwidth of uh, this particular license. And for each bidder I, at around T of the auction, you will calculate the sum of all this quantity indexed on, on the licenses on which this bidder has a current I bid. Meaning in the, so he is the potential winner for these licenses. You calculate the sum of these quantities for all these potential winning licenses for him. And then you impose that across the rounds along the, the auction, this quantity does not increase. So meaning as a bidder, you know, along the, the auction, the prices will increase. I cannot increase the quantity that I'm asking. I need to decrease my quantity, but I cannot increase it. Meaning that from the start, I need to be very active to secure quantities to have the right to continue to bid in the auction. And when the prices rise, people should expect me to bid on less quantities, on less licenses, and not on more licenses. And so these activity rules is used to force you to be active during the auction and to not wait until the end to, to bid. And so that was very a practical design that was proposed by, by Milgram and that is working very well and is, has been refined over the years uh, with different versions. And so it speed up the auction and forces bidder to reveal some information in being active. And so one second interesting practical design example that I have in mind that I find very interesting you know, I told you that in practice, the theory cannot, you cannot develop the model that will capture all the every possible detail of, uh, of, the, of the auction in practice. And one interesting thing that they realize, so there is a bit of trial and errors, is that in the first auctions, uh, companies were using the digits of the bid to pass messages to their opponents. And so this is one quote from Milgram. He was saying that in a DEF auction, there was one company, uh, US West, that made several bids terminating by the digit 378 on licenses where this other company was bidding and at the standing I bid. And these bids were actually a retaliation from this McLeod company bid on the license number 378. That was the license that US West was interested in. And so the, the US West was you know, signaling to McLeod, be careful, and if you try to bid on 378, I will bid on your license uh, and, and you know, disturb your plan. And so you should, you should not bid on license 378. And so that's something you know, that is hard to capture in the theory. You don't expect people to do this, uh, especially. So in practice, they say, okay, so we will just allow bids to be discrete from a, from a menu. And you will just have to bid, uh, you know, hundreds by hundreds of dollars, for instance, and we will try to kill this type of messaging uh, that happened in the first auctions. Mm -hmm. And usually in this multiple unit auction, collision is an important challenge. And we, the theory has to be careful and the design has to be careful to try to avoid this kind of collusion and uh, messaging from companies. And so um, I will try to be quick because time uh, moves on. So. Uh, the design was inspired by, you know, if you did some courses in general equilibrium theory, you know what is the Valrassian tatonment, which is this process of trying to find equilibrium prices where you will increase price if de uh, depending on whether or decrease price depending whether there is excess demand or not. And so you know that the uh, simultaneous ascending auction have this kind of feature, right? People are, are increasing their prices over time to try to to reach a, a point where, where all the licenses will be sold um, in the auction. But the main problem here is that the goods are indivisible compared to the standard theory of general equilibrium. And in this auction, the prices can only go up. And so that was an open question whether we, we can have some, some relation with general equilibrium theory. And Milgram in 2000 showed that if licenses are substitutes for the bidder, then this process of the simultaneous ascending auction will converge to a competitive equilibrium in the case where bidders bid truthfully. And substitutes mean that if uh, you know the very standard micro uh, 101 definition of substitutes, which is if the price of some licenses increase, then you do not decrease your demand on other licenses. 
So if they are substituted, if I see prices increasing on some license, I will move my demand on other licenses, but I will not decrease my demand on licenses on which the price has not increased. All the factors of production. Own all factors of, of production. And they essentially rent them out to firms to produce all the good. Sorry, you, okay. <laughs> that was it. Okay, so let me move on. Um, so, so substitutability of, of these uh, preferences is important in the theory uh, to have this type of existence and the fact that the auction works well. The problem is when you have complements, uh, then the auction becomes more complicated and runs into problems. And this is an example with complements. So why do you, why you, you might have complements in spectrum auctions? Imagine that you are a company that wants to start a business. And so you need to acquire a minimum number of licenses to cover a region and for your business to be profitable. So it means that if you have two licenses, A and B, then bidder three is not interested in having only A alone or B alone, but is interested in having the two licenses together to run, uh, to start his business. And the problem when you have complements is that you can run into problems. And one problem is what is called the exposure problem which is if bidder three in this example is trying to get the bundle, A, B, he might run into problem because to run to win license A, he needs to bid to beat bidder one and pay at least eight. And to win license B, he needs to bid to beat bid bidder two and pay at least four. And he would end up paying 12 for the package, which is too much for him. Okay. And this is the problem in this auction where while you are trying to bid for B, you will win B, but then you will realize that you should be too high for A and you will end up with only B, but B is useless for you. And this is what is called the exposure problem. So you, you expose yourself of winning only one license that is not useful for you, for you alone because to get the second license, you might end up to pay too much. And so I'm almost done. So this problem when you have complementarities is called combinatorial auctions. And one solution to try to help bidders in that case is to allow them to submit different bids on packages of, of licenses and not on only individual licenses. So you can submit price on A, on B, and on the package AB. So I'm not going to go into the details. It's, it turns into much more complications. Uh, what, so it, it, it requires bidders to evaluate their values for all possible packages. So you kind of see the combinatorial problem here. Even to determine in this auction who is the winner is complicated because people bid about packages that can overlap. Okay, and so you have a lot of computer science problem co uh, coming in and combinatorial optimization. And even in terms of behavioral problem, these auctions can be very complex, and so it's hard for bidders to form strategies in that case. So you um, you can use, for instance, you know, um, uh, lab experiments to try to see how, how people behave in this type of auctions. So I'm not going to give you the details. So several uh, types of auctions have been proposed in this practice. So I, I'm giving the, the reference here. Uh, and I'm not going to describe uh, this, this thing here. So let me, uh, let me conclude here to leave the floor to Olivier. Uh, so my, the last quote, so I hope that you saw that this design of auction evolved over time to be more practical. But now there is a, a bit of a back and forth between practice and theory. And it's very like an engineering activity. So I'm quoting here Paul Milgram uh, from his paper in 2000 that uh, was saying that auction design is a kind of engineering activity. It entails practical judgments guiding by theory and all available evidence, but also uses ad hoc method to resolve issues about which theory is silent. And as with other engineering activities, the practical difficulties of designing effective real auctions themselves inspire new theoretical analysis which appears to be leading to new, more efficient and more robust designs. And I hope that you see here this back and forth. So the theory helps to design better practices and the pra new practices helps to, 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 to have new theoretical questions that foster more innovation in terms of design. So that's it for me. So I, I'm just mentioning one important reference for people who are interested in this. I advise you to read every year the Nobel Prize Committee is uh, uh, is you know disclosing a review of literature of the current Nobel. So this one is very interesting to read and will give you a nice overview of this literature. And these are the two standard textbooks in auction theory for students who are interested to check uh, these details. Um, thanks a lot. Um, Olivier. All right, we're speaking back to back or we have questions and reactions?
let's back let's keep the question for the end uh, okay time, so. fine so let me share my screen I'm uploading my let's screen. see if this works okay all right i think this is okay okay so hi everyone and uh thank you for uh for uh, organizing this uh uh, Julien, this is uh, indeed a very, very nice initiative, and uh, and uh, and it's a big, uh, you know, chance to reflect every year on the work of uh, of the Nobel Prizes. So uh, this will go on, uh, I hope, for many years. Um, this is this is a very, very good occasion for for me, for us in general, um, uh, here to 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 speak, uh, to have this uh, Nobel Prize to uh, uh, Milgram and, and Wilson. Uh, as um, as already explained by uh, by Jean Pierre, I mean there is a you know a very direct filiation from uh, Wilson to to himself that is even uh, going on further with uh, with uh, uh, Jean Pierre uh, working and uh, I think even supervising the work of Sylvain Sorin and Sylvain Sorin was you know also my supervisor among uh, among others uh, uh, students of his so uh, so there is you know direct uh, uh, academic filiation there is also um, there is also a strong connection and uh, intellectual influence uh, that uh, that Beatrice exemplified uh, of uh, of engineering. Uh, you know, given that uh, at uh, Institut Polytechnique de Paris, we are uh, really into an engineering culture, and uh, and uh, and I think it's it's uh, it's a very strong intellectual tie uh, that uh, that relates us to uh, uh, to the group in uh, in Stanford in general. And uh, and also the fact that uh, you know we are trying uh, in 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 Institut Polytechnique, I think, to 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 be more uh, oriented towards innovation, and uh, and the example of the Silicon Valley and the interaction between academia and uh, and uh, and uh, startup companies and the, the tech companies is, is something really important. Um, so just for myself and this uh, this presentation. Um, I'm going to, to, to speak about some particular work. So uh, the idea was to open a little bit. And, um, you know, of course, Nobel Prizes are typically given for some work, but uh, they are also, I think, given in consideration for the importance of the work of, uh, of, uh, of some researchers uh, during their life. And it's a good, it's a good moment to uh, reflect on, uh, on uh, other work uh, of, uh, of the Nobel Prizes. And maybe not just all of them. Uh, actually, you know, some people were uh, were were thinking that uh, you know perhaps uh, David Krebs also made uh, important contributions to to auctions, uh, and you know could be himself considered for for the prize or not. I mean, it's not up to me to say these things, but uh, and and also uh, and also uh, uh, Milgram and 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 uh, Wilson did some other important work. So I, I would like to speak about the work on reputations. And I think this work is another example. There are many other examples. So uh, I'm picking this one, I think, because of the team of co-authors. Uh, it, it's a great example, again, of the, of the interaction between uh, kind of practical considerations and theory. And uh, this is going to be maybe a little bit oriented towards the development of good economic theory than uh, towards the development of uh, practical work. So I'm um, you know, going to be compared to, uh, to, um, uh, to the previous presentation a little bit more on the side on the, of theory, but let me, let me speak about uh, what is the gang of four uh, here. So that's not exactly the same gang of four uh, as Jean-Pierre mentioned. Uh, this gang of four is uh, the gang of uh, David Krebs, uh, Paul Milgram, John Roberts and Bob Wilson. So they wrote three papers published in 1982 that started the question of reputation. So the first paper is by uh, Treps and Wilson here. Uh, another paper is by Milgram and Roberts, who were, uh, you know, authors on many uh, uh, important works. And the other paper is the four of them. So, you know, probably know that a gang of four refers to a a band, and you know, that's the idea of calling a, a nice group of four uh, people uh, a gang of four. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about this this work and 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 what came before and and what's coming after, and trying to put this a little bit into into an interesting context. So, you know, one thing that uh, you know is probably now extremely well accepted, but uh, 
there are always discussions around uh, around this is um, what could be defined as the central assumption of of, uh, of economic theory uh, maybe over the last uh, you know 50 years and and I, I think really you know very very central assumption is what's called Asian rationality so this is the idea simply that you know agents uh, uh, make decisions that are good for themselves whenever they have to make a decision, okay? Well, not necessarily good exposed, but they are good at least according to the information they have. Um, what's good about this assumption is that this gives a lot of structure. Uh, this is, you know, as we know, uh, 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 very, very disciplining in terms of the models we use. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't fit perfectly the data. It depends on the exact definition of, uh, of what you want to do. But uh, the example I'm going to, to give is one in which you have some form of contradiction uh, or, or, or tension, paradox, that's how we call it, right, uh, between uh, data or, uh, or stylized facts, at least, and, and a theory. And that's a very interesting uh, 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 moment to revisit the theory and to revisit the models and uh, while maintaining the idea of, uh, of rationality. Okay, so the idea is that you know we stick to to rationality. We don't want to give it to to give up on this, and 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 we try to understand kind of what's wrong with the model. How the model could be enriched, in a way to give uh, a lot more uh, interesting results and and a much uh, broader and and uh, uh, illuminating theory. So. Um, uh, this is this is you know about the the, the question of uh, you know rationality. So rationality could be a little bit seen in two ways, and I think these these are these are ways that are important. They should speak to us, um, you know, both in uh, in micro in political models. If you look at the way uh, you know politicians make decisions, if you look at central banks and so on, uh, one way is whenever you have to make a decision, you have to make a rational decision according to the information that uh, that you have okay so wherever you are you are you don't ask yourself so much you know uh, why you are in this situation and you should try to make the best out of the situation so if, if you look at this idea of uh, sequential rationality in game theory this really comes from the work of uh, Reinhard Selton uh, who actually developed the idea to himself criticize the idea uh, using the second bit game for instance and Krebs and Wilson uh, really formalized this idea into uh, the central concept of sequential equilibria in uh, in games with uh, imperfect information okay so again the idea is whenever uh, a player has to make uh, choices well these choices have to be rational they have to be you know going into the direction of this uh, this uh, player's interest at the moment when the choice is made and according to the information uh, the, the information that the the agent has okay uh, so somehow the idea is here uh, you know forget the past and, and look at uh, look where you move uh, from now on. So the other way to think is, is uh, reputations. It's a different angle. It's a different angle because it says that whatever you do today is going to influence how other people are going to, to think about you. So this is something you have in all signaling models. Okay, if you think of spans, if you think of everywhere where your actions convey information about your future behavior, uh, then, uh, then uh, uh, you have to somehow look at the past because the past tells you how people behaved in the past and, uh, and they give you information about how they may behave in the future. Okay, so um, uh, reputation is one channel for, for this type of arguments. I should have put the uh, wording on uh, central banks, politicians and so on. Uh, at this point, right? Because uh, really central banks are trying to do this. They are trying to induce a reputation that they are going to have a certain behavior. So they are trying to enforce a, a form of commitment into, into what's a good behavior. And, and, and this will coordinate the economic activities in the future as much as possible. So politicians, you know, uh, all type of factors are doing both ways, right? They are, they are thinking, here we are, now what should I say today? And the other thing is, you know, what did I say in the past? And how can I enforce the idea that I'm someone consistent and that I'm someone trustworthy? And, uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's looking in the, in the forward way. Um, another way of looking at this argument of forward induction was developed uh, in a different type of uh, concept by, uh, by forward induction 
in the work of Kohlberg and Mertens. And there are very nice back and forth uh, 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 ways between uh, the work of uh, Krebs and Wilson, sequential equilibria, then stability by Kohlberg and Mertens, and later on, uh, Wilson, who uh, decided to himself revisit uh, the notions of uh, stability from from Mertens. So that's not, you know, going to be the the the, the talk here. Uh, so I will I will insist on this uh, on this idea of reputation. Okay. Uh, sorry. Let's go forward. I was going backwards. All right. So uh, what's the game of interest to us? Okay. That's a simple game. Uh, that's the you know very basic game that uh, that you see probably in uh, all uh, game theory classes. Um, um, it's the game of uh, two players. Uh, there are firms, typically. The firm one is uh, an entrant who may uh, decide to enter in a market or not. And uh, the other firm is the incumbent. So the incumbent is already there on the markets. And the entrant may decide to come into the market. And uh, whenever the entrant decides to enter the market, the incumbent can decide to uh, wage a war, like say, you know, spending a lot of money of advertisement, cutting prices, doing some very ag aggressive strategy, or saying it's fine, you know, I was a monopoly, I was doing lots of profits, now we're a, a duopoly, and uh, I'm going to accommodate to this new situation of being a duopoly, right? So let's look at payoffs. So here, payoffs are represented by, you know, stacks of coins. I guess uh, they are enough for us if there is nothing wrong with my, uh, my, uh, my nice drawings. Uh, um, everything should be, should, be, uh, should be fine. So let's assume that the uh, entrant first decides to enter the market here, right, in this direction. Fine gives uh, empty pockets to both of the uh, firms. This is really bad. This is, this is you know, kind of a, a price war. Uh, they play, let's say, a Bertrand equilibrium. They make no profit. Uh, they all live with empty pockets. Accommodate is, okay, kind of a little bit more collusive equilibrium. They don't necessarily collude. Maybe they, pay, uh, they, play, they play a corno equilibrium and they both make uh, some profit by sharing the market. Okay, so this, this part is fine. Now, uh, this outcome here you see to, to accommodate is not the best outcome for the, for the, for the incumbent, for the, for the incumbent, right? Because the incumbent would actually like much better if the entrant did not enter the market in the first place. So if we look at what happens on the left, this is here the best situation for the incumbent who gets a lot of money. And this is not so good, but not so bad for the entrant who doesn't lose you know, any money, but you know, can go somewhere else and, uh, and make a business somewhere else, okay? So I hope everything is all right for the, for the preferences of, 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 the, of the two agents. And if you look at this game according to, uh, to Nash equilibrium, according to you know, this, this solution concept of equilibrium, you see that there are two equilibria. There is one equilibrium in which the, uh, the entrant uh, does enter, Okay, followed by, let me try to find something good. Okay, does entered, followed by accommodate. And there is another equilibrium in which the entrant does not enter and, uh, and the incumbent fights. Okay, so if you look at the uh, equilibrium in which the entrant enters and the uh, incumbent accommodates, uh, it, it's clearly straightforward that for each, uh, you know, the strategy chosen is the best response to the strategy of the other. It's maybe a little, little bit less obvious on the other equilibrium. So we see that the entrant does not enter because the incumbent would fight. Okay, so uh, for the for the entrant, changing strategy to enter would lead to a fight and would lead to empty pockets. And it's much better not to enter in this case. Okay, if you look now at the situation of the incumbent, you may say, well, is it rational to fight? Well, yes. Uh, well, according to Nash equilibrium, at least it's rational because uh, because uh, because the entrant does not enter, so you don't need to fight. You can just pretend that you would fight if the other would enter the market, but you don't need to fight. Okay, and so this is a Nash equilibrium. We're fine, this satisfies the notion of Nash equilibrium, but this does not satisfy the notion of sequential rationality or subgame perfect Nash equilibrium for our case or backwards induction, whichever way you want to look at it. Why? Because you may say, okay, now if the entrant does enter the market, we are in this situation here, and we are in this situation here. And once we are in this situation, 
Now the uh, incumbent has a choice to fight or to accommodate, and it's clearly much better to accommodate than to fight. It's too late. It's too late to change the mind of the entrant. And uh, because of that, it should be clear that uh, at this node, the uh, only uh, sequentially rational action for the incumbent is to accommodate. Now, if the entrant anticipates this, the entrant should decide to enter. And this is why the only subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of the game is the one in orange, which uh, consists of the entrant entering and the incumbent accommodating uh, the choice of the uh, of the entrant. Okay, so everything every far, so far so good. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look this time at the uh, Nobel Prize to Reinhard Sutton uh, a few years ago, it's clearly mentioned that um, this type of uh, of reasoning. Uh, that that was that was the reasoning of certain actually uh, uh, was uh, was anticipated by uh, by more than 20 years by an economist called Aaron Director uh, who who concluded that predatory pricing is irrational okay so it's like you know doing the fight because you want to deter the other one from coming into the market is not something rational the incumbent is not rational by uh, by uh, by fighting in this game and, and actually, th this way of thinking was quite influential because if you think now a little bit in terms of regulation, uh, you would say, you know, there is no there is no reason to regulate, uh, you know, to regulate the market somehow and 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 try to uh, enforce that the incumbent should not fight uh, because because the incumbent would not fight. I mean, it's not rational for the incumbent to fight. So uh, actually, this reasoning led to the U.S. Supreme Court to be quite lenient uh, in terms of their attitude towards uh, uh, price wars. So basically, the idea here is that price wars are not anti-competitive. Okay, good. So that's what we have, you know, in the in the entry game. Uh, now, what happens in what's called the chain store paradox? And the chain store paradox uh, comes from the the work of certain again. Uh, now you imagine the previous game, uh, just like here. But this time you have a first entrant, and the game is played whichever way. And uh, after this interaction is done, you know the outcome is observed. Everybody can see what happened. And then there is another entrant, and then a third entrant, and a fourth entrant, and so on and so forth. So the idea you can imagine that you know the incumbent is a big technology firm, and that you have uh, lots of different startup companies who are the different entrants. You can imagine that uh, the uh, incumbent company is uh, you know eBay or Amazon. Who is there uh, in in lots of countries, and the incumbent are uh, uh, the entrants. Sorry, are, are different challengers in uh, in some in some parts of the market or in some uh, in some uh, geographical areas. I mean, this happened if you look at it, for instance, with uh, with eBay uh, that was developing worldwide, and uh, at the same time, people were developing their their own startup companies, their own auction companies in different uh, in different countries in the world. And the question was. You know, would eBay enter and and fight them, uh, basically by uh, being extremely aggressive in, in terms of marketing to drive them out of the market, or would eBay, for instance, buy them out or or, or accept to to split the market? Okay, so now you have a lot of them. You have a lot of these entrants, and if you if you if you want to apply the the, the reasoning of sequential rationality, what do you get? Well, sequential rationality, you know, you can go by backwards induction and you see what happens in the last interaction. And the last interaction says, as we said before, right? Forget the past, nothing matters. Uh, you know, uh, you don't care what the entrant and the incumbents did in the past. You have just one interaction and the game is over after that. So in this one interaction, you know that, uh, that uh, the uh, incumbent is going to accommodate whenever uh, whenever uh, the entrant enters, and therefore the entrant should enter. And and okay, so now the, you know no problem for the last interaction. And now if you look at the interaction before the last, you have the same reasoning and so on and so on and so forth. So the only sequentially rational outcome of this uh, uh, chain store game is that all entrants do enter. Sorry for this. Okay, all the entrants do enter. And all the incumbents accommodate, and this is going to happen no matter what happened in the past. Okay, and this is the important part. It's no matter what was played in the past, telling you that even if the uh, if the uh, incumbent decides to fight, you know, uh, for many many periods, uh, the entrants would still say, okay, I don't know why this incumbent fought. 
uh, all I care is what's going to the the incumbent fought. Yeah, I all, all I care about is what's going to happen in the future. And in the future, I know that the incumbent should not fight because that's the only uh, sequentially rational action. And therefore, I'm going to enter again and again and again with the same reasoning. And this this really goes against our intuition. You know, I hope it's a little bit shocking because. This goes really against the idea that, uh, you know, in everyday life, uh, you know, and again, think of uh, politicians or central banks, firms, you, we try to establish a reputation, okay? We want to show that uh, through our actions that we have a certain way of behavior. And we want others to accept, expect us to be consistent with this way of behavior and somehow learn our, be, our behavior in, in a way that we influence uh, other, uh, other uh, players in a, good, in a way that's good for us uh, in the future. So we'd like through our actions to discipline the actions of the others in the future. But in this game, this simply doesn't work. Right, And the way that the incumbent would like to discipline the others would be by fighting the first entrance, showing you know, that uh, it's not a good idea to, to, to enter, and so that the future entrants are uh, afraid of, uh, of entering the market. And if the future entrants are afraid of entering the market, then it pays off to uh, fight uh, to fight the first sanctions. Okay, so the question is, you know, I mean, I think the the the, the paradox was well understood, and certain understood the paradox for sure. And and the question is, you know, what do we do about it? I mean, does it mean that sequential rationality is a bad idea? Okay, and we come back to the you know first kind of general program that uh, that uh, that I was uh, uh, outlining a little bit. Uh, what do we do? Uh, well, we, what we do is, uh, well, we could abandon a little bit rationality, but we don't like that so much uh, because we'd lose a lot of structure. So potentially it could go anywhere. Uh, we could abandon some rationality, but you know, it's better to look at uh, what, what's missing in the model. Okay. And what's missing in the model, that's where the solution of the gang of four is that actually, you know, we know all models are imperfect. Okay, all models are, you know, extreme simplifications of more complex situations. And, 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 and let's think a little bit about, you know, we could think of many, many ingredients in which the chain store is, is not an accurate description of, of a real life situation. We could, you know, try to go many ways, but many ways would give nothing interesting. One way that was uh, that was identified uh, by, by, by these people in the Gang of Four is, is the following. They say, look, it could be the case, it could be the case that the incumbent, you know, is, is, is what we call a crazy type typically, okay? A crazy type means the incumbent just likes to play fight. Maybe that's the incumbent's preferences, you could rationalize that. You know, we know some people, yeah, they are crazy, they just like fights, okay, whenever they can. Or, uh, or maybe, you know, this is someone who is committed to, to fight, somebody who doesn't have the, you know, accommodate button. Uh, it's not possible for this one to, to do this. And, uh, and okay, so that's, that's a new model, okay? Now you have a new model in which the uh, incumbent could be, you know, rational, let's say, uh, we call that rational, just meaning having the preferences as before, or being crazy, meaning having these new, these new preferences, okay? But what you don't want is to have a model in which, uh, you know, which is very different from the previous one, right? If you say 90% of, of, of incumbents are crazy, of course, this is, you know, nobody would want to enter because I would be afraid of entering, okay? Uh, let's say 1% or half of a percent or, or, or one tenth of a percent of, of, of these incumbents are, uh, are crazy. Well, then maybe it's a realistic model. Okay, when I face someone, you know, driving a car, you know, well, maybe these people are, are crazy, let's say doing some actions that I consider irrational with very small probability, uh, at least in my mind. So I want to take that uh, into account and I want to have a model which accounts that. Okay, so now I want to look at the model in which, uh, um, uh, let's say in the mind of the entrance, the incumbent would be of a crazy type with at least a small probability. And I'm asking the question, do I still find the same equilibrium as before? Now let's say I'm not a crazy, I'm not a crazy incumbent, I'm a rational incumbent. And I say, assume that, uh, you know, it's anticipated that we play the equilibrium as before. It is anticipated that, you know, whenever the entrant enters, I, I share the market, I, I accommodate. Well, then I have a very easy way uh, to make a gain. Uh, and this way is simply that I'm going to find the first entrant. 
And because it is anticipated that I'm not supposed to find the first entrant if I'm rational, then I'm going to signal I'm crazy. And everyone is going to believe I'm crazy with probability one. And this is great for me because now no one is going to fight me off, okay? And, and all the future entrants are going to stay out of the market and I'm going to make all the best profits of all the 99 remaining interactions. So that would be fantastic for me. So this shows for the moment only one thing. It shows that the old equilibrium in which there is this repetition of entering, accommodating is not an equilibrium anymore in a situation with a crazy type with even a very, very, very small probability, as small as, as you want. So that's what we call a perturbation, right? You take an initial model, you make a model which is in a certain sense, very, very close to the initial model, and you get very different equilibrium. That's why it's interesting to look at, at, at a perturbation. So what did the gang of four show? And they say that, uh, well, if you look at equilibria, what's gonna happen is that uh, the, uh, the, incumbent, the incumbent is going to fight all the first entrants until let's say the, the last 10 or the last 50 ones until the kind of the end of the game. Right. So, uh, and, and why? Well, again, is because by doing this, you kind of signal uh, that uh, you know you 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 might be crazy, or at least you want to signal. And the fact that you want to signal is going to indicate the fact that you're going to do it. So, so others don't want you to don't 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 want basically to enter. Okay, they don't want to test you. Um, and then you know the incumbent can play uh, accommodate, but only at the end of the game, as as I said, uh, with the uh, last entrance. What's very interesting is that if you look at this game uh, repeated many times, the, the, the equilibrium payoff to the incumbents is close to what's called the Stackelberg outcome. And the Stackelberg outcome says the incumbents can commit to a strategy and say, I'm going to apply this strategy now, okay, forever. And you play, but I'm going to apply this strategy. You see that there is no real commitment device here. I mean, there is no commitment device in the game, but the outcome of the game it at equilibrium is as if there was a commitment divine through which the incumbent could commit to playing, it's not an A, it's an F, to commit to play fight, okay? So that's very nice. Reputation is what we want, right? Uh, I mean, this, this is what we want in a reputation is that I'm able to commit to uh, play in a certain way and people are going to learn that I'm committed to play in a certain way and, and that may benefit me because, because I built a reputation of, of, of a type uh, which I would like, okay? So, um, so that's, that's, you know, that was something extremely interesting, developed a lot of work. There are a few uh, lessons we can, uh, we can get from that. So here I separate first the in-game lessons. What do, we, uh, the, what do we understand in this game? Well, that the reputation effect can really be captured by the introduction of what we call these, these crazy times, which are, you know, Bayesian games, which are small deviations from the uh, uh, initial games, and 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 this is this is interesting because it's a it's a channel through which uh, what I play today can influence the others' beliefs on on what I'm going to play tomorrow, and that's really you know nice. That's something you want to use in uh, in other applications. Uh, again, central banks, uh, macroeconomics is 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 something uh, is something uh, where uh, this type of model is applied. Uh, these gave rise to a very large literature. So uh, very influential papers are the ones of Fudenberg and Levine. Uh, maybe because I'm a little bit immodest, I like to uh, to 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 mention my work, which is uh, related to the idea of learning. Uh, of course, there are other other papers, uh, a large trend in this in this direction. The idea is that it's related to the theory of learning because the channel uh, of reputations is that if I play a certain way, others are going to learn that I'm playing a certain way, right? So, so the, 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 this idea of what can you learn is is really important in the uh, reputations literature. Uh, and again. And again, this, this very important fundamental idea of, of uh, all the analysis of, let's say, stability of equilibria, robustness with uh, incomplete information, uh, you know, lots, lot, lots of different ways to look at what is stable, even in trembling hand by, by Selton, is that you look at something that looks like your original model. Okay, an original game theory model, very simple, the game tree, something, you know, fixed preferences and everything. 
And, and you look at a very small departure from this model. And here, the small departure is the little bit of incomplete information. And, and, and you look at, uh, at the insights from, uh, from this small departure. And, and what is beautiful in the, in the case of reputation models is that this small perturbation gives rise to very insightful uh, results uh, that, uh, that uh, cannot be captured by the initial model. And these insightful results are uh, are new illuminations into, uh, into applications. And I would say to come back to this uh, guiding, uh, you know, idea of uh, going back and forth between theory and practice, uh, sometimes you start theory, you develop your theory, you get paradoxical results. Uh, this is strange, you have to understand, you know, uh, maybe sometimes it's because you don't understand well the data or the real life. I mean, this is also, you know, one, one thing that theory gives you is, new uh, new uh, insights about uh, about what happens in in uh, in real life but sometimes you also have to take some idea insights uh, reactions from you know the real life results to enrich a theory and and and, and then come back to theory and and get a, a nicer and uh, and better and better theory and and in this case again uh, i think that rationality was uh, was a very very strong uh, guiding principle uh, that uh, that was kept throughout, and uh, for for a good reason, and and uh, that's uh, that's leading to uh, to a, a better and and more interesting theory. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Olivier, uh, for this great talk. Uh, so we will move uh, quickly to Beatrice for this last part. Uh, it's the last but not least. So please, please uh, stick around uh, for this uh, broad. Uh, so Olivier, maybe you can. Yeah, I'm trying to stop sharing. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, so to conclude, I'm gonna give a bit of a uh, broader perspective um, very quickly. So this is gonna be really three stop, like a market in the 20th century, like three slides. So of course, the, this, this is gonna be a bit, um, uh, I'm not subtle, not, not detailed. I'm going to start from the criticism that um, the prize raised because it's not, not that I want to enter this criticism, but I, everyone should be aware of it because it says things about the state of the, uh, of the profession. Um, so there are very, very different types of criticism, some that, that were to be anticipated and other that, that I, I personally found uh, puzzling. One, one first criticism that yeah option auctions can be gamed and this auction the the FCC auction were actually gamed um, the reference was not so uh, the, you, you get a reference here the reference is not to the first FCC auction that that Julian talked talked about but the second one the uh, 2017 uh, two-sided auction and, and the idea was to actually buy uh, some um, spectrum license from TV uh, broadcasting companies to resell them to uh, mobile phone uh, companies who need it most. And what happened, what emerged, so the story goes that um, uh, as the auction was uh, sev several years into the making, because it takes like several years to write these algorithms, um, it surfaced that uh, the, the, the algorithm people were uh, like Milgram and others were doing were, was only strategy proof if uh, the TV broadcasting company that, that wanted to sell their uh, license uh, each had one license to sell. If you had accumulated several ones, uh, you basically had a, an incentive to, uh, uh, to uh, retain some uh, and not uh, sell some so uh, as to uh, drive the price up. And somehow uh, some um, companies and private equity firms uh, became aware of it and managed to buy a lot of license from a lot of small regional uh, TV companies. And so that's that's part of the story. And, and the problem with the story is uh, with these people, sometimes famous economists who argued that uh, the, FCC, uh, the, the, the FCC auction was gained for business profit, was uh, actually uh, uh, gained in the name of business. And uh, an associated criticism is that the non-Nobel non -Nobel Prize uh, is neoliberal and it rewards neoliberal endeavor and it's a big tool for big business and whatsoever. Um, so I don't want to, and you have a screen captures about that kind of uh, article, I don't want to take side or explain. What I'm going to do next is just uh, 
uh, replace in context why uh, the notion of liberal li liberalism surface uh, often in relation to that kind of work and argue that it's not a dirty work and it's a work that economists should engage with. Um, two more uh, types of criticism. Uh, the second one is about the normative character. Uh, so not the political character, but the normative character of auction. I don't have time to go through that. The question is, uh, uh, what, sh what, what, sh what is a best auction? Is it something you decide as a scientist or something you have to decide as a philosopher? So I refer you to a recent paper by Zoe Itzik uh, that's called the, um, the normative gap in, in market design. And basically she takes the example of uh, the redesign of the Boston algorithm to allocate uh, K-12 uh, students. And basically she says, um, uh, you have to decide whether the best option has to be uh, an option uh, with stability primarily or strategy proofness. And if you decide one or the other, basically what you do is that you enact different criteria from distributive, for distributive justice. Um, so it's a complicated reasoning. So if you're interested in the normative aspect of auction, that's a nice paper uh, where to start. And the third criticism that was the most, uh, third type of criticism that was most puzzling to me that I, I really didn't expect uh, was, uh, was uh, who are this guy? Why do we reward useless work? Uh, I'm mentioning these criticism because they were again placed by high profile uh, economists. You see the snapshot uh, uh, by a tweet by Branko Milanov. It says the problem is not the name of the people. The problem is what's it gone? Is it a social science who aim to help understand the evolution of society and improve human living condition or a subsection of financial manipulation? And it goes back to uh, why Kene would have gone the Nobel Prize, where Ricardo and whatsoever. And in response to that, I, I actually want to I was puzzled because to me, this is really the price that was to be expected that, that goes into a long tradition, century long tradition of thinking about market, which is basically the, market, the basics of what economists do. So I just want to replace um, um, the, the, that price. So no, not the specifics about auction, but uh, picture a price on auction about as a price about uh, thinking about market in the wider uh, intellectual uh, history of, of, of economics. So I could, I could go back to uh, I could go back to Adam Smith. I'm not going to do that. I don't have time for that. But the question all this criticism raised basically is who benefit for auction, which I said I was not going to uh, talk about. Uh, is market design a tool for neoliberal or for socialists? Actually, the people who are uh, uh, like Yu Wicks, for instance, who was the economist who actually devised the term uh, mechanism, uh, thought about that. So I'm, I'm going to go back to that a bit. Uh, and that raised another an underlying set of questions that is about how do market operate, who should operate them, and what are the relationships between the state and the market. And that's, to me, one of the mo most fundamental questions in the history of economics. Uh, so I'm going to do, as I said, going to do just like three quick stop to show you that this was a question that has agitated economists for a long time. Uh, I'm going to start in the 30s, so not that far uh, ago, and I just want to mention that there was something called the socialist calculation debate on which a lot was written. Of course, it was uh, in the context of the rise of um, the USSR. And you had economists arguing, so socialist inclined economists and market inclined uh, economists, Mises and, and Hayek were on the market side, Lange and Lerner were on the socialist side. And the question was, uh, first, whether a central planner uh, can replicate market outcomes uh, in the context of whether the USSR can, can allocate goods uh, as well as, for instance, Western countries, and whether it can even improve on this allocation. Um, and so you had a debate with some people saying, yes, I mean, there are market failures. That, that, was, that was not called yet market failures. I'm going to go back to that, but that was on everyone minds uh, already at that time. And, and basically, uh, socialism in the central state can improve on market allocation and other people in Hayek primarily say no it's that's not possible you have calculation issues so you, you have a famous quote here 
um, uh, the market is a system uh, on the utilization of knowledge which nobody can process as a whole. It leads to people to aims at the means of people who, uh, whom they do not know and make use of facility by which they have no direct information. That our whole modern wealth and production could arise only thanks to this mechanism is, I believe, the basis not only of my economics, but also much of my political views. So a few things here. You see in this quote, um, whether markets allocate goods better is always both an economic and a political issue. Hence that, uh, that storing with neoliberalism notions. Uh, second, what, what was Hayek's point about? It was about uh, information is dispersed. Uh, no one is at all and no one can calculate it all. Okay, so basically what it does is picture markets as information processors, okay, and which sort of in reaction to that, the whole variation program, so what you learn as students as Arrow de Brew in the two theorems of welfare economics is basically a reaction to the challenge set by Hayek. So if market are information processors and they basically process uh, information through uh, churning out prices, uh, one question they became concerned with and economists became concerned with is uh, whether there exists a price equilibrium and whether the price equilibrium is unique. Note that at that time, another question that was more difficult to uh, answer and that became the core of what we're just seeing in these two hours is how are the price reached? Uh, think about the commissaire priseur at that time, that this kind of stuff you learn in Econ 101. And now as you move throughout your economic career, you move to question about market design and how we, how do we engineer a set of price, okay? Uh, and related question raised by Hayek where how much do an economic agent know? Do we have as economists to assume that they know stuff or they're, they, they are rather ignorant? And that, 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 that goes into very different types of economic organization. And the last question was about spontaneous order. I mean, do we need people, someone to organize the market or, or is this information process occurs as spontaneously? Uh, which is a uh, which is also a question on, on which there was a lot of change on, uh, of mine. Okay, so you see, actually, uh, the Valrhesian program was a reaction to, to to Hayek's challenge and to Hayek's and other economists discussing the relative merits of centralization versus uh, market economies. Um, <laughs> I, at, at the same time, in, in the post-war, you had what is called the rise of neoliberalism. And I'm just going to show you one quote here. It's a fam very famous quote by uh, Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman called himself a neoliberal. In, in, in 51, he published a, a famous paper. He, he make, makes a famous conference that called neoliberalism in, it, in its prospect. And uh, you see here how he frames neoliberalism. He says the major fault of the collectivist philosophy has not been on the ends. Collectivists have wanted to do good, to ma maintain and extend freedom and democracy, and at the same time to improve the material welfare of the great masses. The fault has risen been in the means, failure to recognize the difficulty of the economic problem of efficiently coordinating the activities of millions of people and so forth, okay? This is super important. Uh, why? Because it basically picture neoliberalism as a question about means rather than hands. So a scientific question that economic school enter. Okay. And because of that way of framing, you see why again, um, uh, the question about, uh, about the political aspects of economic surface in that kind of discussion. Okay. So it's up to each economist to try to disentangle them. But here, uh, Friedman entangled them together. And the bottom quote shows you what was the really new thing about, uh, about neoliberalism. B basically, it's not that this state is against the market. It's basically that the role of the state is actually to, uh, to engineer the market. The state would police the system, establish condition favorable to competition and prevent monopoly, provide a stable monetary framework and relieve acute misery and distress. So the, the, the new things with neoliberalism is basically this, 
to say, okay, the state, the, there is no spontaneous order and basically markets are created and, and the state has to help create and maintain markets that works well, okay? Uh, so that happens at the same time, that this is a context for uh, the valoration program. And the third element at that time was, as, as long as you think about market, you think about market failures, okay? So Bob Wilson in his presidential address say, okay, when I was here in the late 60s, there were the Stiglitz and Spence emphasis on, on information issue, but that, that runs prior to that. You see here, it's a, a three page, uh, very famous paper by Samuelson that basically define what public goods are. And he concludes the paper saying, okay, so we know that in theory, there is an equilibrium, okay? Uh, the solution exists. The problem is how to find it. So you see here, economists evolving from existence of an equilibrium to how our uh, um, allocation determined. And basically what it says immediately is it's very hard to find it because people don't behave like benevolent bureaucrats. You see here, uh, they would say uh, people have incentive to depart uh, from indoctrinated rule uh, to snatch some selfish benefit. Okay, so you do, you do have strategies here already, okay. Uh, and on top of that comes, uh, and I'm going to end there, comes to your weeks, okay? And what your weeks does is basically change perspective on the market and actually de-emphasize perspective from the market, which is not always remember. So basically what it is going to say, uh, uh, here you have a quote from uh, uh, the early lecture I gave at the AEA. So the early lecture is when you publicize your new approach, basically, and it says um, the term design, so traditionally, that's the very, very first sentence of his lecture. Traditionally, economics analysis treats the economic system as one of the givens. The term design in the title is meant to stress that the structure of the economic system is unknown and that you can basically engineer that structure, okay? So it shifts the emphasis from studying market to actually engineering designs and designs are, uh, uh, sorry, to um, <laughs> designing or engineering mechanism and mechanism are mechanism are whereby um, the information that each agent uh, has uh, result in, in an outcome. It can be a market outcome or it can be a non-market outcome, okay? And, um, and of course, it has as well known as has been told by, uh, uh, by uh, um, Julien, Olivier, etc. What one key feature of of this mechanism has to be strategy provenness. So he, he is one of the first to, uh, as I said, Samuelson already said it. But things change in how you engineer market if you are able to model it. And your Wix was able to model these strategy uh, provenness uh, issues and to open the way to new research program. And at the bottom of the screen, you see uh, how to him. This new research program that became market design, mechanism design first, so the theory, and then the practice of market design uh, relates to how economists view market and basically wanted to go beyond that. Uh, he says, uh, the origin of my work uh, is uh, the point in my interest has been a, a broad class of situation, broader than the advanced industrial market economy including situation in third world country and in countries uh, trying to be socialist. And the, my issue, so going beyond whether you are a market economy or not, uh, can you construct efficient mechanism that has a decentralization feature similar to a market economy? Okay, and at that time, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on, on that point, this raises a question on, uh, going back to the political uh, aspect of market design as whether market design is agnostic uh, towards actual policy, uh, political system or not. One way to study that, that historian have gone into recently is to study whether uh, Soviet unions and Soviet economists were using actually the same kind of tools. And we are finding out that the, the mathematical tools and, and the type of economic reasoning were strikingly uh, similar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Beatrice. Uh, so we are done uh, with this uh, two hour lecture. I hope that we, 
didn't kill anybody. <laughs> but uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. So the goal would be to, to continue this maybe every year if we have the occasion to do it. And uh, if you liked it, please uh, let us know. And uh, so we'll try to put the video online uh, at some point. And so I would like to thank uh, Jean-Pierre, Olivier, and Beatrice who helped me for this uh, organization and all these very nice talks. And so, uh, so I will just leave the Zoom open. We can open to questions and discussions if people want. And, uh, and thanks a lot.